Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to our Spring Oak Forum for 2021. Uh, delighted to have you here back for our first event in 2021 and um, a great one to start it off. For those of you out there that are Spring Oak lovers, um, might be just interested in giving them a go um, this year. The forum this morning is going to hopefully be a really good resource for you in terms of technical information and the discussion and um, between our expert panellists um, of speakers here as well with us today. So my name is Theresa Meadows and I'm delighted to be here with Gordon Gowlett jointly hosting the Spring Oak Forum this morning. Um, a tradition that Gordon will explain in a minute um, that's come about over the last few years and it's great to take it forward in this virtual way um, this morning. So just um, before we start, um, you're all on mute and we can't hear you or see you sadly, um, but if that means you've got children running around in the background, that's fine. They're welcome to learn about oats as they eat their porridge this morning, um, but we very much want to, to hear you um, and to be in touch with you. And you can do that by using the chat box that comes through um, to me. I can see that, um, not anybody else. Um, so if you can send um, any questions you've got as we go through the morning, if you've got technical questions or you can't see us or hear us for any reason, pop them in there as well. Well, and myself or my colleague Christian will answer those for you. We're scheduled to be here till 10 o'clock today um, and we've got lots to get through and, and plenty of time for questions um, to finish by then. The session is being recorded so if you want to look back at the slides um, or the details it's being recorded and you'll get an automatic email with that. It'll also go up onto our HTB series and also all your seeds YouTube site as well. Many of the speakers today have Twitter handles and are happy for you to get in touch and, and take the conversation forward um, if there's further things to do today and they can all be accessed using those there as well. Today's session has got two basis and one Neuroso point eligible for it. If you'd like to claim your basis and Neuroso points, if you pop your um, name, account number and postcode for basis and the same including your date of birth for Neuroso into the chat box that's in the grey panel on the side, then Christian and I um, will register those for you. If you're watching this back on the recording, if you'd like to email me, teresa.meadows at ahdb.org.uk with those details, I'll make sure you're registered for those as well. So over to you Gordon to give us a bit of a background. Oh good morning everybody and welcome um, and thank you very much for attending, a magnificent attendance today. Um, this is our fourth Spring Open, has its root, uh, sorry Spring Oat Forum, um, it has our its roots in the local East Anglian discussion group who recognised that there was a sparse amount of uh, and ancient information um, available to spring oak growers. Um, so thanks to the help from the Felix Cobold Trust and the Chad Acre Trust, we were able to set up some trials and conduct those together uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, with others. And we presented the results to this, the first forum. Um, the notion being that to aggregate the work into one delivery point, um, would be a greater benefit than the sum of the parts. And we've seen a wide range of results, magnificent yields of above nine ton a hectare, and right down to three and a half ton a hectare, which is a pretty dire consequence. Uh, we have also had good quality. We've had over 55 specific weights, uh, which is very acceptable for milling. But on the other hand, we've been down below 40, which is not much good for feed. So very wide ranging, um, inconsistent uh, crop at the moment. There is one consistency and that has been, well, last year was an exceptional season. <laughs> and maybe this is the new normal and not a fresh challenge for farmers with the weather that they have to um, manage as much as anything. Um, but today we've got uh, three speakers who've done work in, um, uh, with spring oats and um, their experts joining us later for the question and answer uh, session. So hopefully uh, we'll get some uh, key points to help us with our quest to grow milling oats successfully from spring sowings. Fantastic. Thank you, Gordon. Um, a great introduction and yeah, we're delighted to have you 
all joining us as part of this discussion and building on the work that has gone on um, today. Thank you, Gordon. So um, just as a bit of a format for this morning, um, the plan is that Rosemary Hall, we're wel welcoming um, first. Rosemary is going to talk us through the trials work that she's been doing um, recently in the last few years, um, specifically focusing on drilling dates and cover cropping. We're then going to pass on to Ian Lutie. Ian is um, a farm manager and going to talk us through his experiences of growing spring oats and, and things to watch out for um, from the farming side of point of view. And then we're going to hand over to Dr. Stefan Boych and Stefan is going to talk us through oat breeding and varieties and the lessons that have been learned in, in terms of how you get best out of the varieties from the work that has been going on um, in Germany. We're then going to come together as a panel and have the questions and discussion um, at 9.30. And joining us then um, is Sarah Clark from ADAS, who's led a lot of the oat um, research from an ADAS point of view um, and industry. And James Webster from AHDB, who's going to be here um, for any market questions and things as well. So we are going to run through the presentations uh, back to back and save the questions and discussion for the plenary session. But please feel free to put any questions into the um, GoToWebinar um, session and we'll make sure that they're picked up when we get to that question session at the end. Gordon and I will then wrap up and like I say, we'll be finished for 10 o'clock. So. Um, just to give us a flavour of those of you that are out there, we've got over 300 of you sat um, here this morning. I think we need a bigger spot than new market and great to have people from across the country um, joining us. So we're just interested to see um, for those of you that are all listening in, what's your experience of growing spring oats? So we've got a quick poll. If you select um, one of these, if you click on the screen um, and select those and submit your answer, we'll then be able to um, share and look at the expertise that we've got around the room, um, as well as um, with our panelists here today. So we've got your wide awake this morning. We've got 64% of you that have worked out um, how to do that, um, up to 70%. So Christian, would you like to share the results, please? And we've got a really nice group of you this morning. So 34% have been growing for a long time, 34% um, grown for the last few years. Some that started in Harvest 2020 and quite a few of you um, that are listening in um, to see what spring oats um, might work for you and your rotation um, and there as well. Brilliant. For those of you that have been growing um, for the last few years or for a long time, um, we would just be quite interested to see where, where you see the successes um, and where you have the challenges with spring oat growing. So those of you that have been growing for a while, um, which parts of your spring oat growing regularly meets your expectations? Do you often get the yield, the quality? Do you get the agronomy right? Do you get the marketing right? Do you achieve your spec? Um, just be quite interesting to know what, what you find that you regularly get right um, from your feelings. So we'll just let a few of you vote as we um, have this morning. Okay, if you'd like to show the results, Christian. So um, quite a lot of you, yeah, getting about half of you getting your yield right, your quality there, the agronomy, um, not too bad, marketing spec, um, possibly a bit lower. Uh, so then the, the things we'd like to improve on today, and um, we'll just do our last poll, which ones maybe are you struggling with a bit more out of those same ones? So this is the last poll. So which one of those maybe do you, do you feel like you get a challenge um, in there and maybe you'd like to learn, you're here to learn a bit more um, from our speakers today. No pressure, um, <laughs> Rosemary and Ian and Stefan, um, hopefully we'll be able to answer some of these. So if you'd like to show the answers to that, it's quite interesting, um, almost matches exactly. Um, so the yield and the quality, you'd still like to know a bit more, maybe a bit less on the agronomy, um, but the marketing and, and how you achieve that spec is things you're all interested in. So um, there we go, half and half, um, those of you doing so. Plenty that we can do and we'll pick up on all of those points um, through all of our, our speakers today. Um, but great to, to get that feedback from you. And like I say, please pop your questions in the question box as we go through. So I think without further ado, um, a welcome to you, a welcome to our speakers and we'll get started um, with our content. 
So our first speaker uh, this morning is Rosemary Hall. Rosemary is an independent technical consultant and trials coordinator um, running trials in association with Jordans and Rye Vita and many growers across the country and is going to bring us her expertise um, from lessons on some of the trials um, this morning. So over to you Rosemary, thank you very much. Thanks Teresa, good morning everybody. Um, next slide please. Um, I'm going to talk to you um, today about a study that we've done for three years across 2016 to 2018, looking at drilling dates, seed rates, variety, particularly Mascani versus Elian, um, drilled in the spring, and also touch on a cover crop uh, research project that we're in, uh, done the first year of last year, and just show you some of the initial data that we've got to date. Next slide. <coughs> Um, so first, if we talk about the drilling date study we did, there's a bit of background to why we did this trial was Mascani um, was being grown in the spring and the end user wasn't favouring the quality um, that was coming from this, that they had no actual data to support why they didn't favour the quality. Winter oats were coming under increasing pressure from black grass, um, particularly with loss of pesticides, herbicides and seasonal conditions. There was also the work done by um, Jordan's Dry Vita specifically, um, particularly on springs, and they considered the grain to be the wrong size for the process, but again, there was no data to prove, prove this. And also at this time, we had a new variety, Elian, come into the market, which was showing increasing um, interest in quality benefits. Next slide. <laughs> So first, before I go into the data, I thought it'd just be interesting just to touch on the weather within those three years, just so you could get a bit of a feel um, for any anomalies that might have shown. And um, generally, our data was quite consistent out of three years. Um, we had a few small blips in data in 2016. Um, and I appreciate this is UK data that I'm showing you, and it obviously will vary from region to region. But in terms of temperature, um, in 2017, we seem to have some higher temperatures in February, March and April compared to the other years. And in particularly in 2018, April and July were particularly quite warm. If you go into the next slide. Um, looking at the sunshine hours, um, interestingly in 2016, which is the yellow bar, um, we had particularly low sunshine hours in June, but in 2018, May, June and July, we had considerably more hours of sunshine. Next slide. Mm -hmm. but for rainfall, and again, I appreciate this is region, uh, not regionally based and it can vary a lot. Um, but on the whole, if you look at it from a UK basis, the three years were quite um, comparable. Next slide. So before I go into the data, I just wanted to show some pictures really to illustrate um, what we were seeing in field and how the crop varied as you go through the dream dates. In, in all of the pictures, Mascani is always on the left hand side, Elian is always on the right hand side. So in the top left picture, you can see um, this was drilled in 25th of February and the two varieties are very comparable in terms of their growth stage and um, their maturity. As time goes on, you can see Mascani slowly starts to slip behind. You can see that in the March the 14th drilling on the right hand side, and particularly as we get to the April the 7th drilling, which is the bottom photo, Mascani is well behind the Elian. Um, and um, at that stage, there is just a few panicles just starting to come out. Next slide. So um, just to reiterate what we did, we compared Mascani and Elian at three drilling dates, and we always went for February, March and April. And within the three years, we tried to get those drilling dates as close as we could to each other to keep the comparison the same. And we looked at three seed rates, 200, 300 and 400, just to get a rough idea um, of what we might need. And, and I think it's key to note plant populations do tend to vary from season to season. Um, this is generally shown the 2017 data, but the actual trends and what we're seeing in the data is exactly the same for all three years. And as an industry, the target plant population tends to be around the 260 plants per meter squared, although a range of 200 to 300 seems to be acceptable. However, as you can see from my data here, it clearly shows our populations are below target and where we are generally around the 100 to the 150 plants per meter squared. Um, I think what is key to sort of note as you look at the data, in February, the plant populations are quite low, 
but Mastani and Eliana are performing the same and generally we do get a slightly higher plant population as you increase your seed rate. If you look at the yield data, which is in the black dots above, <coughs> Eliane clearly outperforms Mascani in the yield. Um, and there is a slight increase in yield, more so with Eliane, as you increase the seed rates. If you look in the March data, which is the yellow bars in the middle, um, again, we're seeing a very similar response. Um, and the plant population numbers are quite clear again in the Eliane that they clearly go up as seed rate goes up. Mascani stays relatively stable. Um, but it's quite clear the yields have come down, um, but we are still seeing an increasing yield as you increase your seed rates. However, this changes once we get to the April sowings, and um, quite interesting with the early and we have a reverse effect on the plant populations. So we actually had a higher plant population in the 200 seeds and a lower in the 400. Um, and again, you can see the yields have been adversely affected. They're a lot lower um, than where we were in February, as you might expect. Um, Ascani is sort of plateaued, they're all pretty much the same between seed rates. And with Elian, interestingly, we're still getting that step up in yield through the seed rates. But although we've got a higher plant number um, in the 200 seeds, it actually did achieve the lowest um, yield. Okay, next slide. If we just move on to some of the data um, from these trials, and generally it's all, all the same. So um, if we're looking at seed rates, we always got a significant benefit from 300 and 400 seeds. Um, 200 seeds was always significantly generally worse when it came to yield or quality. And there was very little difference, if, if at all, no difference between the 300 and 400 seeds per meter squared. If we look at yield, um, and as we expect, and as we've already mentioned, if we look across the data, which is on the left hand side, um, Eliane has outperformed Mastani, Eliane is in the orange line and you get a steady decrease over time um, in yield, as you would expect. If you look at seed rates, um, the 200 yielded the lowest, and we actually, 300 and 400, there was no difference, and they gave the um, best yields. Next slide. Um, again, we're seeing a very similar effect with screenings. Um, so with the drilling dates, again, on the left-hand side, actually, as you delayed your drilling and got later, you're increasing your risk of screening levels. And although these screening levels wouldn't actually affect um, some of the contracts that are out there, it's just something to be aware of. Um, and maybe in different um, seasons, we might see this get progressively worse. It just depends. But again, Ascani have slightly lower screenings than Elian in this case. Um, and again, when we looked at the seed rate, which is on the right hand side, our 200 seeds again was given us um, significantly higher um, screenings, whereas the 300 and 400 seeds per meter squared, we were actually reducing our screenings and again they were comparable. Next slide. <coughs> If um, we look at the hectolitre weights, Elian outperformed Mascani quite considerably at this stage. And again, on the drilling dates, um, it followed the similar pattern we've seen the yields that as time goes on and you delay that drilling, your hectolitre weights go down. And actually for Mascani, once you get past sort of that middle of March stage, your hectolitre weights um, have fall quite considerably. Again, if you look at the seed rates, the lowest seed rate, 200 seeds, was actually giving us the lowest hectolitre weight, and we were getting better hectolitre weights once we got into that 300, 400 seeds per metre squared. Um, next slide, please. And again, um, we're seeing the same with the hulling loss. Um, so we actually had a lower hulling loss in February, and as time went on, the hulling loss increased, although this was actually lower for Elian. Elian seemed to be more stable across the drilling dates. Um, and again, if we look at the seed rate, the hulling losses are actually much greater again, at 200 seeds per meter squared, but started to come down once we got into the higher seed rates of 300 to 400, um, and to some quite good acceptable levels. Um, next slide. So just to summarise um, uh, the drilling date study, it's a bit of a flash through the thing uh, data, but basically after February, Mascani is very late to mature compared to a true spring. Um, it not only impacts on yield, but has a large negative effect on quality and delayed harvest date. 
Um, never plant mascari in the spring if extreme conditions are forecast. It doesn't have the vigour to deal with the extremes compared to a um, known spring. It's an inconsistent variety if grown in the spring and performance is really very season dependent. Um, highest yield and quality is achieved from the earliest sowings, in most instances February, which isn't too much of a surprise. Kellyanne outperforms Mascani, and with Isabel coming through onto the market from KWS, we expect Isabel to perform very like Elian, if not better, in some of the quality instances. Um, statistically, there is no difference between 300 and 400 seeds per meter squared regarding yield or quality, and 300 and 400 seeds has always achieved the best results overall through the three years. Um, we are recommending for people to aim to sow around 300 to 400 seeds per meter squared, but obviously this would need adjusting according to the normal situation that you would do for any other cereal, so looking at your seedbed conditions, level of weed burden, etc. And soil moisture and good soil contact is required for, good, uh, for germination. If the soil is very wet, germination can be reduced, so all these things need to be taken into account. And plant populations do tend to vary from season to season, and a lot of this is due to um, your seabed conditions and also obviously the weather that we um, get. And one thing to remember is oats can compensate for a very low plant population through increased tillering and the development of more grains per panicle. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so um, next I'm going to touch on cover crops in spring oats. Um, and we are in the first year of three um, with this trial. Um, we still have a lot of data to process. So a lot of what I'm trying to show you today is a bit of a snippet um, into what we've seen so far. We haven't had a chance due to COVID to get the quality samples um, put through the lab. We've, um, we're quite behind with this at the moment. Um, but I think there's some interesting data um, to show. So the real background for this and why we as a company with Jordans particularly wanted to look at this was obviously we know things are changing with soil health and water quality within agricultural systems. Cultural policies are changing rapidly. We're losing pesticides. We're looking at tighter regulation of fertilizer use um, on crops. And um, we wanted to look at growing the crops more sustainably whilst maintaining the yield and quality. And also with spring goats becoming a larger part of the oat area grown due to black grass pressure, we wanted to look where cover crops could help. So, you know, could we look at reducing our artificial fertilizer input? Could we help improve soil health and structures? Look at all the environmental benefits that might be associated um, with all these areas. Any potential savings to farm, but without impacting on the yield and the quality of the crop. Um, next slide. So we set up um, the first year of trial in Winchester last, um, well, be two years ago now, um, with um, buckwheat, phacelia and linseed as our cover crop mix. And the reason for the choice behind this was the grower didn't want any brassica or cereal in the mix um, because he was worried about the rest of his rotation. Um, so we went with what the grower was happy with. The cover crop was planted on the 29th of August and he direct drilled um, the cover crop, um, removed the straw, direct drilled it and then rolled it and this was following a spring barley crop. Um, they did grow a cover crop in the same field in 2016. Um, the cover crop was sprayed off on the 3rd of March and we drilled Elian direct um, on the 31st of March. Um, next slide please. So just to, before I get into some of the data, this is just to show you a little bit of um, what we were seeing in, in the field. And, and basically what I got the farmer to do was to, he drilled the majority of his field with cover crop, and then he left two tram lines as just stubble. So we had a comparison area. So both areas had um, a trial imposed, and within these two areas, we um, looked at nitrogen dose response, and we also did a phosphate response within um, both areas. Unfortunately, due to the season and the conditions that drill in, the cover crop never got away. Um, it was quite a small cover crop, but although it's quite a small cover crop, we were surprised at the results we um, got. Next slide. Um, we have took this is quite a busy slide, I appreciate, and but one key thing to note, we've got a lot of soil data, but it was quite clear to show um, particularly with organic matter, that we were getting high organic matter levels from the cover crop um, compared to the soil stubble. So the cover crop 
in October, we were getting 8.7% uh, organic matter, and in the stubble, it's 7.5, which are, are good levels. Um, and again, this was repeated in April. Um, we were seeing 8.1% um, in April in the cover crop and 6.9 in just the stubble area. So it's just to show that we are getting some soil uh, results. Um, there's a lot more to, to go through yet. Uh, next slide. Um, and again, these are just some pictures in the field. And again, we took a cover crop analysis in December just to see what was in the cover crop and what we might be getting. And from this, we calculated that we were getting around 35 kilograms of nitrogen um, from within um, the actual cover crop. At the time of sampling, though, no buckwheat was left when we did sample this due to um, obviously the frost killing it off. Next slide. <clears throat> And these are just some pictures just to show when we went to visit the trial in June, actually across the trial, when you looked across it, there was no visual differences apart from the no nitrogen plots standing out. But actually, when you pulled plants, it was quite clear there was big differences between the cover crop and the stubble area and that we were seeing greater fresh weight and biomass um, where in the cover crop area compared to the stubble and particularly where we were putting phosphate on as additional treatments as well. Um, it was quite pronounced which we called the plants. Next slide. That basically shows this, the same. Um, next slide. So I'm just going conscious of time. Um, if we look at these tables, again, they're a little bit busy, um, but it's quite clear if you look in the top table um, from June for the cover crop in the top table, if we look at treatment three, which was 100 kilograms. Um, of nitrogen as a comparison. Um, and then the bottom ones highlighted in green are all the phosphate responses. So we're looking at 30 uh, kilograms of phosphate up to 120 in 30 kilogram increments. And it's quite clear from the cover crop we're actually getting significant increase in fresh weight uh, within the crop from these phosphate responses. Um, we're getting up to 68 grams extra and, and it was going up with the response. However, in the stubble, the fresh weight was generally lower um, on the whole with 104 grams um, when you looked at treatment three as the comparison compared to 133 um, when we were in the cover crop situation. And then although the, um, there was an increase in fresh weight apparent through the phosphate rates, um, there was much lower weights compared to the cover crop. And if we actually look at the total nitrogen, um, which is the second column from last, with the cover crop, it's a clear increase in total N through the N doses. Um, so we did um, 50 kilos up to 200 kilos at 50 kilogram increments for the nitrogen. And um, in this, we got a nice step up response. And again, we saw this happen where we then increased the phosphate and put added phosphate doses um, in the bottom section. Um, yeah, there's much greater levels of nitrogen where phosphate was added compared. So if we look at the treatment three comparison, we got 65 kilograms total nitrogen available where we were just applying 100 kilos of AN. But if we then took that up to applying um, 60 kilograms of phosphate with the 100 kilos of N, we were getting 105 um, kilograms of N total within the crop. Um, and again, a similar effect was seen in the stubble area, which is in the bottom table, but to a much smaller extent. Um, and similar effects could be seen for the P, but again, at a lot lower levels. Next slide. So if we had to look at the yields that we got from these trials in just the first year, and this is only one year of data, so some caution needs to be taken. But as you can see, the orange line is the cover crop. and um, it out yielded um, the stubble area considerably over all the nitrogen doses. Um, but to actually achieve the optimum yield, we were looking at 150 kilos um, of nitrogen um, in total. Um, but for the stubble area, we were around 100 and 150 kilos in order to get um, optimum yield at this stage. If we look at the phosphate, which is the next slide, please. We have a slightly different story and probably more interesting, but um, 
to achieve the optimum yield where we're looking at just the phosphate, so we're keeping the nitrogen at 100 kilos throughout here, um, and then adding phosphate. So um, the second data point is just 100 kilos of ammonium nitrate, and it shows that we're around the five and a half, 5.7 tonnes a hectare for both areas. Actually, as we started to add our phosphate, the differences were quite apparent. And just with 30 kilograms of phosphate added to the 100 kilos, we actually achieved our optimum yield in the cover crop, and we were just shy of seven tons a hectare. In order to achieve the optimum yield in the stubble, we actually needed 90 kilograms of phosphate, which was 60 kilograms of phosphate more in order to achieve this. Next slide. So as a bit of a whip through um, and a look see with um, sort of minimum interpretation of data so far, but it's quite obvious to see that we have um, benefited with different, uh, better soil structure and increased soil organic matter. And although there's no visual differences across the field um, when you walk through, pulling plants actually showed a clear response. We're getting greater biomass and fresh weight. Um, there was a clear visual response to phosphate more so than nitrogen. Um, the data clearly shows the cover crop has supplied both N and P to the crop with positive results. We're yet to work out how much of a benefit this is um, from a number of uh, angles. Um, the optimum nitrogen acquired to achieve yield in the stubble area is between 100 and 150 kilos. Um, for the cover crop area, we were looking at 150 kilos. But I think it's important to note that we actually um, saw an increase, we got a 1.5 tonne a hectare increase in yield in the cover crop when you compare the 150 kilos in both areas. So that's quite a considerable increase um, in yield. And if you actually looked at the averages across the board in the trial, in the cover crop area, we we're getting around 5.8 tonnes a hectare from a nitrogen um, application, and in the stubble, we would only see in 5.04 tonnes. Um, the optimum phosphate required to achieve yield in the stubble area was 90 kilos. For the cover crop area, it was 30 kilos. And again, if we looked at the averages, these are quite um, different again. And for the cover crop area, for phosphate yield, we were seeing around um, 6.59 tonnes a hectare from the crop. And if we looked in the stubble area, we were getting around 5.78 tonnes a hectare. And that's me. That's it. Thank you. That's a very dramatic finish there, Rosemary. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, it's brilliant um, to have your run through. Rosemary, if you just don't disappear for a minute, we'll just hand over to Ian to share his slides. Um, I just might ask you a question, Rosemary, that's popped up. Um, so many questions that have come through for that um, we'll go through later, but just one that actually I think would be quite useful for those that haven't got much experience of growing oats um, is the question about um, hulling losses and whether you could just explain um, what a hulling loss is and how it's measured. And I think for those that haven't grown oats that might not be used, for, used to that, would you just um, chat that through? Because I think it'd be useful for Ian's presentation and Stefan's as well. Oh, I think you've muted yourself again, Rosemary. Yeah, in terms of hulling loss, um, it's difficult for me to explain because I don't actually deal with the quality side so much. I just get given the information. So. Um, hulling loss is basically when it's the sample gets put into the hulling machine, it's to do with um, the number of grains basically that come out that haven't been able to be dehulled. So we're trying to assess um, how much of the grain is actually viable for going through the process and how long it needs to dehull. Um, and in certain situations we find and in different seasons the hulling losses can be quite different the, the hull just doesn't come apart so um basically the higher the number for the hulling loss the worse it is so i think generally if we're around the 20 percent 20 um figure then that's about normal you know we're quite happy if it's around sort of 20 20 25 once we get higher than that that becomes quite significant because the actual amount of grain that you're losing in the process is it is passed as waste effectively. Hope that yes, helps a little bit. Yeah, no, that's great. It's really important for those that are going for the milling specification, isn't it? That's what the mills, one of the main things the mills look at. Anything to add to that, Ian? Or I think that's a great description, Rosemary. Well done. 
Yeah, it's good. Um, thank you, Rosemary. We've got lots of questions from lots of people uh, related to your presentation. So much useful um, and very relevant information. Thank you. Um, we'll come back to you with those questions in a bit. Um, so we're now going to hand over to Ian um, to talk us through his experiences of growing um, spring oats and um, from here, his farm um, based in Cambridgeshire. Over to you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you, Theresa. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Ian Lucy, and I've been uh, farm manager for RH Topham Sons for 13 years. Um, and just a quick bit of background, the farm is about 1,450 hectares, about two thirds owned and a third rented, um, with a combinable crop area of 1,320 hectares, with a big countryside stewardship area, taking up a lot of the rest of that area. Um, so we got into growing oats, um, partially by accident in 2016 with a loss of new nicks and we had some failed rape so we drilled some uh spring oats in some less than ideal conditions um in late april 20th of april um directed into the stubble from the failed rape um and it rained just after we drilled them so that's what helped that situation um it was very wet still even at, even in late april so it was a bit of a a look see and maybe a cover crop if it didn't come to a crop um but that crop went on to do very well considering how it went in and it came back um we didn't harvest it till 20th of, of september and it was over one and a half meters tall i'm amazed it stayed standing up i don't know how it stayed standing up i think the weather was very kind to us on that then that year but yeah that year we did six ton a hectare so we were quite pleased with that and um, we were good marketing price and low growing costs we and then gradually increased our area over the years um, as challenges of growing rape have got bigger and bigger. Um, and over that time, we have had yields ranging from four and a half to seven and a half um, tons a hectare. Some of the worst yields were this year, um, where we lost significant quantities of oats on the floor with two storms that came through in mid August. And that was despite trying to prioritise the harvesting of the oat crop. Um, but with oats, I think it's very important as a farmer uh, that we look at marketing of them before we grow them. As they are a very small market and they can be quite fickle, I think it's very important that you identify what your end user wants to start with. Um, we started out with Canyon as that was our starting point of oats, um, as they were looked a good variety on the recommended list. Um, and then the second year, um, at one of these oak conferences, we heard that Richardson's wanted um, people to grow Elian because that because of the better palatability of the of the Elian. Um, so we had a look see on them, and moving forward from there, we made the decision to um, drop the Canyon and go to all Elian after the look see. Probably slightly less yield, but we were trying to grow for what the end user wanted, and we managed to secure a contract for a good percentage of the crop which made us feel comfortable growing that crop. Um, so that's why my comment on variety versus yield is there. Um, our, our experience was that the Canyon probably yielded slightly, slightly better, but the Elian was what the end user wanted. And there's not much point in growing a crop if you can't sell it. So that was how we moved on to that point. Um, and then over the years as we moved, moved along with it, we have set, tried, to, tried to spread our risk of this crop by trying to get a percentage of the crop sold on a contract generally it's been a wheat futures linked contract and then growing up percentage on the open market and i've found this has worked very well for us because it's meant that some years the contract prices have been best and some years the open market prices have been best but it's given us a very good overall average price um so when i was thinking about this presentation i thought what can i focus on so i came up with some key pointers um establishment is critical as with all spring crops, getting that crop in, up and away, rapid is uh, key to yield in our experience and trying to get an even establishment, which um, some years has been difficult because of our dry springs. In East Anglia, we find we go from too wet, too wet to no rain. Um, so in 2017, we had an issue where we ended up with two crops. We tried to drill the crop shallower to get it up and away, but we lost too much moisture and 
some came quicker and some came later, which was a nightmare to manage. So I, I, I would urge, don't be afraid of drilling a rate slightly deeper to make sure you drill into moisture. Um, we we'll also come on in a minute. We've done some seed rate trials over the years, um, which interestingly approximately agrees with what Rosemary was saying earlier. Um, so once we've got it established, um, we then need to look after the crop, um, which we we find the crops very responsive to manganese. And so in the drier summers, we found that our tissue analysis has also shown boron and magnesium is in need in the tissue analysis. So we try to correct this where we can through the season. Um, we control, well, yeah, sorry, on the nutrition wise as well. So fertilizer, again, a bit like the establishment of seed rates, we have played around with nitrogen rates to some extent. Um, and frustratingly, what seems to be the right thing to do has been limited or destroyed by the weather. So we've tried various nitrogen regimes and uh, we always end up with about 120, 130 kilos. Are where we settle, depending on the nitrogen cause. Um, the gut feeding and interesting trials from last year suggest that we can get more yield from more nitrogen levels. But other years we've had a lower uh, optimum nitrogen response. The uh, agronomic, some of the work we've done with ADAS on the nitrogen suggests that putting uh, some, some nitrogen on to help to help fill 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 the grains is beneficial, but when we've actually done the, tr the trial work in the field, it's generally turned dry, and so we've actually struggled to get the nitrogen up taken, even using liquid. Um, so we've actually found that putting it all on the seed bed or by the third by the free leaf stage has been as good. One year we did manage to get a visual difference um, from the later nitrogen in the crop. But this didn't trans transfer into any yield or improvement in hectolitre weight. But I'm still personally believe that if you had um, a wetter growing season, that our later nitrogen would provide a benefit. So maybe it's something you look at doing later in those years. We control for us has been quite straightforward. Um, a nice bit of glyphosate before we drill them, and then a SU to tidy up the broadleaf weeds, which we try to do if we need to before. Um, before start stem extension so that it's out of the way to not interfere with growth regulation. And if you've got wild oats, then maybe don't grow tame oats as a break crop in those fields. Um, growth regulation, we try to see what the season's throwing at us. Um, we The preferred experience has been little and often. So we, we've tried to go two smaller doses rather than one big dose. But if you're new to growing oats, um, when they decide to grow, when they decide to move, they move very quickly. So in a week to 10 days, they can go from doing nothing to panic that you're not going to get them under control. But then the weather can change and uh, they stop dead. So I haven't got the answer on growth regulation, but deal with what you see, I think would be my summary on that, really. And as I mentioned a bit earlier, they definitely require harvesting priority, um, as the last year har highlighted. Um, they don't wait for the combine, so once once they're fit, you need to get them, or else you'll leave some of it in the field. Uh, moving on to my uh, view on the seed rate. Um, so in 2017, which was the first year we did the seed rate trial with Elian, um, you can see there's quite a interesting yield increase from the higher seed rate. But this was drilled at 20th of April, and it was a fairly dry spring. So, um, which makes some some logic that drilled later has got less time to tiller. Um, the next two years, we did the same trial because I never believe one trial. Um, and the next two years, you can see there's actually not a huge amount of difference between 300 and 375 seeds, um, whereas the 475 was um, did lead to a slightly lower yield. Um, so then, moving on from that seed rate trial. We, 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 we've now stopped doing that seed rate trial. We think we've got enough evidence as to where we need to be. Um, the and our, our, depending on the season, but we look at between 350 and 400 because black grass is a um, concern for us. Although with a spring crop, that pressure is significantly reduced. Um, and then just to try and to draw a few points from my overall analysis, um, some reasons to grow oats for us are um, they're fairly cheap crop to grow. 
and they're a lot lower risk crop than Aussie rate, although they have got a similarity of Aussie rate in that they don't in that they don't um, hang on for the come by. So um, the the, the um, other factors are the spring oats are not the first choice for the openers, so therefore it's important to get a good um, a good contract first. So, 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 so then, sorry about that. Um, spring oat for the contract. Um, the risk of failure of making million specification is a risk with the oats. If you only end up with feed oats, the benefit is less. Um, the so so far we've been lucky. We've always made million specification, which has helped make the crop stack up for us financially. Um, and as has been alluded to earlier in the present in um, Rose's presentation as well, there's little research data on this crop. Um, on farm trials that we've carried out and i believe we can still do um i think we can push performance a lot a lot higher than we are um it's trying to do that um on a regular basis um as i said this year we found a three quarter ton increase from increasing the nitrogen rate by another 50 kilos but whether was that a seasonal fact i'd like to do that trial again because other years we found that we could have got away applying less so yeah this, what's your space on that one um and to to provide resilience to this crop i think getting the seed rate appropriate to cover for an average season whatever an average season is now is about the best punt that you can take us to a scientific basis because we we seem to go from one extreme to the other um and my biggest fear of growing oats is the oversupply of the market which is why i look to try and balance our risk of contracts so um yeah that's about where we are really and i believe the questions are going to be dealt with later on in the forum um so i will hand back over to Teresa. thank you so much ian um that's fantastic and so much practical information there things to watch out as a grower um from a grower's perspective and yeah we've got some good questions coming in for you as well um a really useful run through of, of your hints and tips thank you um, so without further ado, we're going to hand over to Stefan, who's our last speaker um, of this morning. And Stefan's going to talk us through um, some modern spring oat varieties and from his perspective, what's important to know when growing them. Um, Stefan is an oat breeder and head of the oat breeding station for Nordsart. Um, and we look forward to hearing your presentation, Stefan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Teresa, and I hope you can understand me. Uh, I'm very proud to be in the forum and uh, to, to give our experience on, on old breeding and old varieties with a view to <clears throat> modern breeding. And if you see here in my first slide, we are also active in the, in the UK seed market. Uh, our brand is Sartin Union, which is one of the most popular and most famous uh, breeding brands all over Europe. Northside is one of the seven shareholders of the Sartin Union group and is very proud to be a member of this group, which is very active in the international seed markets. And I'm also very happy that we have our partners from Elsom Seed, which is our marketing partner for the varieties, for the cereal varieties in the UK seed markets. And we have a very good and very fruitful collaboration and friendship with, with the guys from Elsom. And I hope it will remain also even after the Brexit. I'm very, very um, uh, keen on it. And I'm, I see forward, it, I look forward also even after the Brexit. Brexit. Okay, what is oat breeding at Nordsart? Nordsart is doing breeding since 1910, including oats. Oats was uh, oats uh, was a very, very uh, important crop uh, over the last century, as you know, and has lost its importance. But nevertheless, as Nordsat was established, it was a very, very important crop for farming due to the horses. Uh, uh, especially what we have, we have Europe's most extensive and also successful spring oat breeding program. That means our varieties cover nearly one fourth of the whole European spring oat growing. Uh, which is a very, very big success if you consider that we have a spring crop with a very high dependency from regional preferences. That means we have different selection uh, strategies for Central, for Northern, for Western, for Eastern, and for also for Southern Europe, which makes it a little bit more complicated because uh, um, the, uh, uh, the growing preferences differ a little, uh, uh, or can even differ. Nevertheless, we are active uh, between the Atlantic coast and also the Ural Mountains in Russia or even behind that. Uh, what is also important to know is uh, we do want 
to apply the state-of-the-art plant breeding technologies to also to oats, uh, but we are a small and medium-sized company. That means we have to do cooperation. In Germany, we do it with our federal research crop research institutes, the JKI, the Julius Kühn Institute. We have a, a cooperation with the federal plant breeding research institutes, the, the very famous and well-known IPK at Gartersleben. We are funded via the German Federation for Plant Innovation. We have a joint cooperation with the Southern Union Biotech Lab, where we do want to apply Marques and also double haploid technology, for example. We work together with the partners from the German Seed Alliance. This is a cooperation with the companies uh, DSV, NPZ, and also the potato breeder uh, Saka, mainly for the Russian markets, but we have also research activities, mainly also for, for benchmarks, for, for databases, and so on. And last but not least, we have a cooperation with, with Aberystus, with Ibis in the UK, with the winter oat breeding especially. We bring the winter oat varieties, or we try to bring the winter oat varieties from the UK breeding to the central European seed markets. And we have an exchange on breeding material and a very good collaboration also in terms of scientific uh, questions, which is very fruitful and uh, long lasting. And last but not least, which is very important, uh, we have close contact to all other partners in the European oat value chain. That means millers, traders, advisors, and also farmers. You have to consider that Nordsat is also a farmer. We have a few thousand hectares at our farms, and our farmers, the heads of the farms, are our first citizens if we bring varieties to the markets. This is the Nordsat group, and, and, and a brief introduction what we are doing today. Coming back to oats, a very brief introduction and very short introduction is this. This is the development of the yield of oats in Germany between 1985 and 2020. And you have to consider that 99% or more than 99% of oats in Germany is spring oats. So this is a picture of spring oats. Uh, you see the, the yellow squares is the yield of the farming and the, the, the green squares is the yield of the uh, BCU trials, it means the listing trials of the German Federal Plant Variety Office. And you see that we have a widening of the gap over the last 35 years. And this is still going on, and this is very critical, because this is the, uh, the widest gap of all cereals that are grown in Germany, and it's still increasing. And this is, of course, very critical, and there are many questions, why? Why are the farmers are not able to use this obvious breeding progress that you see here from about 57 or 5.7 tons per hectare to 7.5 uh, tons per hectare that we can see today in the official trials. But more or less, we see no development in farming yield. There's speculation about what is that. So, of course, we have lost interest in the crop. We have lost knowledge, information. There's low, uh, there's uh, what also Ian said, there's also a gap of, of trialing, of knowledge uh, transfer. There's also a slow introduction of new varieties. But obviously, there's also a statistical effect because as we started here, there was a, a rather low preference uh, of, of organic farming. But today, we have nearly 30% of oats in Germany are grown on, under organic conditions, where the yield of oats is around about 25 or 30% lower than in conventional farming. So there's also a statistical issue in it. But you can also see that if you have, if you compare 19 with 20, the year 19 with 20, the farmers were able to close a little bit the gap. I will come back to it later why this happened, especially in 2020. So nevertheless, this gap is widening and there's a clear question why farmers are not able to use the potential yield of spring oat varieties in Germany. So uh, the, the same view to, to the grain quality of oats uh, with the main important uh, traits in, in, in this slide. The first is hull content or kernel content as the, as the opposite, which is a very important trait for, for the millers, but also if you talk about uh, feeding value of oats, because you have to consider, today we talk about milling, but most of the oats used all over the world is used for feed, also in Germany, still for feed. So, but nevertheless, you see a clear positive development over this last 35 years, here between 1985 and 2020, we have now the potential in varieties uh, uh, that was going down from 31 to about 26 or 27 percent of hull. So, but you see also there are many, many ups and downs over the years, and we have had critical years, especially in 2010, but also in 2019, which is, was a very dry year for oats in Germany, but also very good years, 12, 16, but also the year 20, uh, 2008 was a very good year with a low kernel content. 
the screenings uh, in Germany screenings are measured not below uh, 2.0 millimeters but uh, above 2.0 millimeters we can see a clear very positive development for for the screenings uh, from 94 to more than 99 percent so this is from a breeding point of view no longer a critical point because the limit here for 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 milling is 90 percent and we can expect that no variety even in bad years like again 2010 and 2019 will come below that even if you use a variety with a very low screenings under very limited conditions for example in organic farming then you can get tr in trouble with that but normally this is no longer a problem in kernel content, the limit by German mills is 26%. You see that we are now able to, to, to get it in many, many years, but not in all years. But I think if you use a quality oat variety in a, in a quite normal year, it's possible to get this 26% required by the German oat milling. The, the next slide is hullability. What means hullability? Hullability is a term or a trait that describes the easiness of the removal of the hull in a mill. That means how per, how many percentage or what percentage of, of oats is hulled in the first step uh, using a defined process of here, a laboratory air press dehuller. And the higher the better, because in a modern oat mill, you have the dehulling process in front of the kilning process. That means dehulling is a critical term. If, if your partner is a modern oatmeal and uses this kind of uh, processing, and you see a clear, very clear positive uh, development with also many ups and downs, the limit that we have in Germany is 95%. So it should be above 95%. And especially the last years, we see that it is possible to get it with most of the varieties. Very bad was 2010. But if you compare with the other years here, 2019, for example, with a higher hull content was not so critical in terms of hullability. It was below the, the, uh, the limit, but it was not as critical as 2010. I will come back to it later on. And the last is hectoliter weight. You know, it's a very critical point, a very critical term, especially because in many, many cases, it defines the monetary value of oats. You see a positive development, uh, but Again, 2019 and 2010 have been critical. Uh, the, the development is not as positive as with the other trades. It's not so easy to get a higher hectoliter weight wire breeding. And uh, the limit, it was mentioned that we have 53, 54, 55 kilograms, uh, mainly defined from old, uh, from Scandinavia, which is imported to Germany on a large scale. Nevertheless, German oat millers meanwhile have recognized that it is quite impossible to get this high share if they use uh, oats that comes directly from the field. There are also some um, processes that can be used to hire so the hectoliter weight, cleaning or good harvest, good storage can increase the hectoliter weight. Nevertheless, to get this benchmark, even with the best varieties, remains a critical point. And the German processing has accepted that if they use oats from Germany, then they have to lower a little bit their requirements to 50 to 51 or even 50 kilograms, which, which will be very sufficient still in terms of the other trades. Okay. If you if you have a look to the growing conditions of oats in Germany, um, uh, the air temperature here based on the period between 1996 and 1990. So this is not considering the actual climate change. Nevertheless, the general tendency is the same. We have warmer regions in the southwest here around the Rhine River, uh, cooler climates here in the mountain areas, but also in the north of Germany, which are more preferable for, for oat grain for sure. Um, the aridity index describes how dry it is over a season in a distinct region, also depending from soil quality, depending also from precipitation for sure. And you see once again, we have in the eastern parts of Germany, regularly high aridity that can occur due to lighter soils and less precipitation, for example, than in the west or in the north or in the, in the mountain areas here in the south. And coming back to, to the precipitation, here you see in the left side the yield potential. These are the data here, uh, combined with the uh, long-term precipitation in the different regions. And you see high precipitation comparable to UK conditions in Germany happens only in the western parts and in the mountain areas. And we can have regularly low precipitation in the eastern parts, which is more continentally determined, especially here in the rain shadow of the Harz Mountains, which is a very, very dry area 
is below 450 millimeters a year. So this is much, much less than in the UK. And if you see through the potential yields that we accessed in, in 2020, this is 2020 data, we have highest yields here in the north, 6.4 uh, tons per hectare on average, which is much more than uh, in other parts of the country. And it came from the um, uh, 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 from the introduction of of farm of, of uh, spring oat farming, especially in modern professional farms, to serve the northern German oat mills. There were many farmers, professional farmers, that came back to oats, and historically. We have here uh, south of the city of Kiel, the so-called Probstai region, which was uh, a very historical uh, popular region for, for Probstai oats, for Probstai hafer, which was used as a donor for, for yield in, in many crosses in Germany 100 years ago. So this is a historically um, preferred region for high yields of oats. This is once again to be visual in 2020-20 yield data. And you see also, if you come to continental oat growing, the yield will crash down for sure. Uh, oats are preferred also with high yields uh, in the mountain areas and the closest area for, for oat growing in Germany is here in the southwest, this mountain area, the Schwäbische Alb or the Schwäbische Alb mountains, where a lot of oats are grown, still grown. And uh, our Federal Plant Research uh, Institute for Crops, for Cultivated Crops, defines so-called soil climate regions based on soil quality and based on uh, the, uh, the long-term climate to separate crops, to separate varieties and to do different trialing and to give different advice. And you can see uh, here the data describe uh, where oats were grown in 2020. And you see in the southwest of Germany, we had roughly 35% of growing, in the northwest roughly 30 and in the northeastern part of Germany, roughly 35%. So roughly spoken, one third of oats in Germany are grown in the northeast, one third in the northwest, and one third in the southwest. And you can separate it also. Uh, I will come back to it later in my tables. So I will give to you now separation over the whole country, but also in the northwest region, more maritime, lower temperatures, higher precipitation, here also sufficient precipitation uh, with uh, higher temperatures and here continental and dry. So this is the overall assessment uh, of, of data. Uh, as a source, I used uh, the treated uh, uh, VCU trials of our federal uh, plant variety uh, uh, board. Uh, and I used the variety Symphony. Why Symphony? Symphony is a variety with a very high ecological adaptability and uh, is grown today in many, many countries all over Europe. It can be grown between Spain and also Russia. Uh, the preference is uh, in the countries around the Baltic Sea. It is one of the largest European spring oat varieties today and serves also as a standard oat variety, also in Germany. You see many, many trials have been used between 2010 and 2020, 125 trials, so a lot, a lot, really a lot. And I've separated the different regions, Northwest, Northeast and Southwest. Starting with the grain yield, you see uh, that the largest grain potential is in the Northwest. So more than eight tons can be get. Uh, the variety is not suitable for growing in the Southwest. Regularly, you can expect that the yield in the Southwest is higher than here. So the variety is also not recommended for growing in the South of Germany, but in the Northeast where it has a higher yield. So uh, grain potential is high under maritime climate and good conditions. Opposite, the hectolitre weight is higher in the southwest and not in the northwest. So it's not running parallel to yield. So hectolitre weight uh, differs a little bit. The same is valid for the hull content. So it does mean that if you have a higher yield potential, it does not automatically mean that the hull content will be lower. So the plant obviously recovers the yield also with a higher hull content. It's a reaction of the plant under good conditions. It's not automatically all gone uh, going to the kernel. Screenings are very good in the Northwest region, maritime climate and also Southwest, obviously it depends from precipitation and from good soil conditions. Same is valid also for hullability. You see the hullability is, is on a very high level regularly in the Northwest and also in the Southwest and not in the Northeast. It must be added that Symphony is a variety that can get trouble with hullability. It's not the very best variety in hullability. And that 
That's why it is discarded for using as a milling oats in continental and dry conditions. It can be only used as a feed oats under those conditions because it is clearly below uh, the requirements of oat milling. And if you look, have a look to the phenological data, you see the main advantage of the northwest region is the, the very long or the longer period from sowing to panicle emergence, the use development, also the grain filling period, panicle emergence to yellow ripening is the longest of all regions, and the overall uh, uh, growing period is, is the longest with 140 days, one week longer than the northeast, but also a few days longer than in the southwest. So this is the main advantage to get a high yield, good screenings, good halability, but hull content and hectoliter rate are not the best. So next point, I have uh, uh, also uh, calculated some correlations. What means correlation? Correlations, coefficients of correlations between zero and one means zero. There's absolutely no interaction or no correlation between the two characters. One means total dependency. So st starting with uh, the first point is, uh, uh, um, oh, what is it? Here with uh, um, the, the yield uh, and the quality. Yield and quality means, yes, you have a very positive effect. If the yield is high, you can expect that also the quality will be high, especially for hard content and for screenings, not as much for hectoliter weight and hullability. This is valid for the whole area of Germany, not for the distinct regions. This is the whole area with this variety. And if it comes uh, to the phenological data, as we have already seen in the presentation of Rosemary, this sowing date and also uh, very early to use development can get profits. Yellow ripening is not so important, but also avoid a delayed harvest. A delayed, a delayed harvest can also lead to lower yields. Uh, the hectoliter weight is also interacting with hull content and screenings in this variety, especially in this variety. Yes, if you have higher hectoliter weight, it may be expected that hull content and screenings are also on the positive side. And how it can be influenced, uh, yes, hectoliter weight also depends from a, uh, early sowing uh, and also from a harvest in time. A delayed harvest can also lead to lower hectoliter weight, clearly spoken. Hull content is here in this variety is interacting with screenings uh, above 2.0. That means the better the screenings, the lower the hull content. Larger grains have lower hull contents. If, it, if you will be able to higher the screenings, then you will have also a lower hull content. Um, the screenings interact with hullability in this variety uh, because this variety is critical, as I mentioned, in terms of hullability. If we take another variety, this uh, correlation will be not so close. But here it is the case. So the better the screenings, uh, the better also the hullability. And uh, screenings can be also positively influenced by uh, early sowing. And also, this is a little bit opposite to hectoliter weight. If you have a longer, longer grain filling period and a delayed harvest, you will get profits with the screenings. Yes? Screenings uh, will be higher, and uh, you have to think, okay, um, if the hectoliter weight will be lower, I think uh, the more critical point is hectoliter weight, and uh, uh, the date of harvest should not be uh, too late. And last but not least, hullability can be also positively influenced by sowing date, and also by an early use development. Hullability can be better in this variety, and once again, if you have a delayed harvest, this is the interaction between hullability and also uh, screenings, you see that hullability can be better. So there is some things that have to be balanced, not too late harvest. I think the critical point is a delayed harvest and not a too early harvest. Um, a little bit more special to the Northwest regions, because I believe that the Northwest regions in Germany is more or less parallel to what the conditions what we have in UK. And I will now give my focus to a little bit more to the differences, what I have shown in the slide before. So what is different? If we come to the Northwestern regions, you see yield and hullability acting even negative. If it means if you have in this region a higher yield, the hullability will become lower because it's already on a very high, regularly on a higher level than in the other regions. 
and cannot be further increased. And maybe the plant reacts on a very high uh, yield level with a more close uh, um, connection of the hull to the kernel, and it cannot be easily removed as before. The date of panicle emergence, so the use development, is not so critical in high yielding regions like in the northwest of Germany, because you regularly have a more balanced season with cooler climate and with uh, better precipitation than in the rest of the country. So it's not so important. Flowing date still remains a, a very important thing. The hectoliter weight and the hull content are in a closer correlation because, as I have shown in, in the table, the hull content can become a critical point under high yielding. Uh, conditions. Uh, hullability and hectoliter weight are no longer in, the, in such a close correlation. And the hectoliter weight get profits by early development under high yielding. So that means early sowing, early date of panicle emergence, early ripening, and not a delayed harvest. This is opposite to what I've shown in the slide before for the whole country. The kernel content is no longer dependent from hullability. So because the kernel content becomes critical, as I mentioned, but hullability not. And a delayed harvest leads to a higher kernel content. So obviously, in, under those conditions, uh, you can even get profits if the vegetation period can be longer. Screenings on hullability are positively influenced. Uh, um, the same as I mentioned here for, for, the, for the yield. And hullability and date of panicle emergence are not negatively but positively correlated in this region. So that means a long use period can lead to better hullability. And last but not least, a delayed harvest is not as critical because the hullability in general is on a very high level. Summarizing it. You see there is potential for higher and more stable springwood yield and quality when you use the actual breeding progress. This is of course valid also for the UK. The yield and the quality of spring roads are highly dependent from environmental aspects. This has to be taken into consideration. This is a spring crop with a quite high demand for, for especially for water, for precipitation. Maritime growing conditions, like we see it in the northwest of Germany or uh, in the UK, in, in main regions of UK, they offer the highest potential yield and good quality potential, especially due to its longer lasting growing period. However, the critical points remain hectoliter weight and also kernel content can be lower. If you go to more continental growing of, of spring oats with a shorter vegetation period, you can get problems with lower grain yield and grain quality. Nevertheless, kernel color kernel color due to, to uh, hot and uh, dry ripening and kernel content can be still very sufficient. You must consider that many, many consumers prefer to have white flakes li as light as possible. And uh, the kernel color very often is better under continental conditions than in maritime conditions. This is one of the aspects of the success of Australian oats in the international commodity markets for oats. And I would say French growing conditions, French means Southwestern Germany, heat waves, but uh, regularly sufficient precipitation. This regularly results in a medium to high grain yield, yes, and good overall grain quality, also okay. But we have increasing problems to get a high level of grain quality due to the heat waves, hot and dry and short grain filling conditions that can occur even in the mountain areas. It becomes a little bit more critical in the last years. We see that there's a relative close positive correlation between spring oat grain yield and characters of grain qualities. That means one very simple advice is to get the highest, posi uh, the highest possible grain yield uh, that you can get. Then you can expect that the quality will be also mostly good, mostly good. And also between the grain quality itself, there's positive correlation, not in every aspect, but mostly. The grain yield of spring oats can be higher if you sow early and you have an early use development. This is a critical point. Avoid a delayed harvest and also avoid lodging. These are critical points uh, to get a high yield. In potential high yielding areas, I would say also UK is a high yielding area for spring oats. Hectoliter weight and screenings get profits by long vegetation period, even long per vegetation period, and early sowing has also a positive effect. Higher kernel content can be achieved not so easy. Here, Varieties plays a major role. 
if you want to do something, early sowing and also a long time for grain filling can have a quite positive impact. Hullability is regularly determined by the growing conditions between panicle emergence and harvest. So the grain filling period is mostly critical. That's why, for example, in continental conditions, that varieties with better hullability are required, for example. And last but not least, consider the possible regional differences, know your location, do field trialing, and have, once again, realistic expectations. Do not do so much. Thank you for your attention, and I'm open for any questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, lots of interesting information there and lots of similarities um, that we can draw from, from your experiences across Germany. Wow, um, what a morning. I've absolutely got a deluge of questions um, here. I've tried to answer a few with our speakers as um, we've gone through the morning. So if we'd like to get all of our speakers back, um, James and Gordon, if you'd like to join us as well. And um, we've got a few minutes here just to answer um, a few more. What I will do, because um, I have got, I've tried to answer some directly back to you. I've put some in the in the questions for the audience on more specific ones from Rosemary and Ian. And what we'll do, if it's okay with the speakers, is we might um, collate them all and maybe get you to answer some of the other ones, and then we'll send those um, answers round to everybody because um, there's some really good questions in here. So, just a few more. Um, while and we're at it, there's a couple of questions about um, yields and. Why do you think the kind of the mean yields have been falling? Um, there's a similar trend in yours, um, your presentation from Germany and um, from some of your other presentations as well. Stefan, is there a, a reason why you see those trends falling at your yields? I would not say that the yields are falling. Um, the yields are stable and we have um, the possibility to get higher yields. This is the regular experience from practical farming. If you have professional farming on the right side, using right strategy, using the actual knowledge, then of course it is possible in, in every year to get seven, eight, nine tons of oats. However, uh, you may expect that the ups and downs in these crops are higher than in a winter crop or in another spring crop like a spring barley. This has to be uh, recognized. And that's why if you grow spring oats, you need a long-term strategy and you must include it into the to the crop rotation and in the, uh, to consider the monetary value, you have also to consider the monetary value of the crop rotation, the crop rotation effects. And maybe not in every year, if you have a look to the single crop, it will be economically sound. And you have to calculate not over one year, but over the whole rotation, with the rotational economical value. I know this is difficult. This is very difficult, but this is the one and only uh, point where uh, spring oats can be competitive over the whole rotation. Definitely, um, and a lot of it's to do with the weather, I imagine, in the last couple of seasons as well that's had that impact. Um, Rosemary, talking about um, costs, has any work been done for you in terms of the cost benefit of the cover crop? Um, there's a few questions that have come in looking, asking that question. Not yet, that is our intention, but only with one year of data, it's a little bit early and plus we're a little bit behind due to COVID and everything, trying to get some of this analysed, but our plan will be at the end of the three year project to have that all in place. Lovely. And a couple more questions on your cover crop. Has, have you seen any effect of lodging and um, what was the cover used in your trial and was the date of destruction significant? So lodging and date of destruction. <laughs> Uh, data description, I think it was March the 3rd off the top of my head, um, the plan was originally to get it destroyed and then drill within a few days or as close as we could, but uh, the spring weather didn't play and we were actually later drilling than we anticipated. Um, in terms of um, lodging, we did get some lodging again the day we went to harvest it, we had a huge storm just as we were about to cut the trial and there's no difference in treatments. The whole trial got some bracking throughout it, which we do have the scores on, but nothing that caused any detrimental effect to the yields or the results that we've got. Brilliant. Um, thank you. And that'll be an interesting one. You've got how many more years of this, Rosemary? A couple more. Two. Two Three more years. Interesting to see as we go forward. Um, Sarah, I don't know if you'd like to do this question or Stefan might be able to answer. Um, there's a, a couple of kind of 
um, okay. agronomy questions. Um, one on work on oat fusarium resistance and one on mycotoxins um, and what variety, what work has been going on that. Sarah, do you want to answer that? Um, there, there has been uh, various pieces of work over the years looking at um, oat fusarium and mycotoxins. That's been led mostly at Harper Adams. Um, and um, they, they, it, it's quite tricky to work on because the fusarium species that you get in oats is different to the fusarium species you get in other cereals. And it's very hard to inoculate plants. So there are there are uh, there is work going on. There's also a PhD going on at the moment, funded by HDB and working with um, Harper Adams. Um, and uh, there's been some um, legislation coming into the EU looking at the mycotoxin levels. But the the good thing about oats is, as soon as you dehull the oats, most of the problem goes away. Um, so uh, that because the hull is where most of the mycotoxins sit. Um, so there, they, yes, there is still work ongoing. Um, it's quite tricky to get a scorecard of risk as you have with DON levels in wheat um, for oats uh, because a lot of the relationships aren't clear, um, but work is still ongoing. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, we've got a, quite a few questions. Um, Ian, I don't know if you want to go through first. There's quite a few questions for you on um, PGRs and what kind of PGR regime you'd use. Um, I don't know if you want to um, kind of talk through your feelings on PGRs. I know you mentioned it in your presentation. Um, okay. Um, the well, PGR. I think, as, as I think I alluded to in the presentation, you've got to, for us in this, in Cambridgeshire, you have to look at what the, how dry the season is. That's always the um, first factor, really. But I suppose my default is a 0.1 of uh, mode of trinexy pack. And then yeah. if if it looks like it's still a bit frothy, then I'll come back with a second dose. Um, and sometimes if I've got a crop which is... Um, looking a bit too lively i've also used canopy but i don't think there's a huge amount between the products i think they both do a job and it depends on the weather um after you do it to some extent because if you get some hot weather after you've done it you can get a double effect from the um, growth regulator yeah thank you rosemary anything to add to that in pgrs no, it's difficult with PGRs in spring gates because, as Ian's alluded to, it's very much season to season, I think, um, and dependent on the weather, which we obviously can't predict at the time. Um, I think the main thing to know with PGRs, if they are, is never to tank mix them. There's a big issue with crop safety, is trying to avoid tank mixing where you can. And also, if the crop you believe is in any kind of stress and is obviously trying to keep your applications to a minimum, uh, review your rates. Um, yeah, as Ian said, as well, the products are, are quite much of a muchness. A lot of it, to whether you need one or two applications and what rates, is very much dependent on your crop and like, what the weather's doing at the time. I think it, it, it's a it's a tricky one. <laughs> yeah, definitely not an easy um, one to look at, and maybe something, Sarah, that we could look at more um, as wider research for going forward um, in there. Um, yes, yeah, there. There has been um, a little bit of work done on PGRs, um, and it, it. I think Ian's point earlier of um, looking at the crop, but also being careful because the spring oats, particularly in East Anglia, go through their growth stages so quickly, and to keep an eye on things, that's that's quite an important point as well. Definitely. Um, and a question for you here, James, from Neil. Um, have, are there any export opportunities for milling oats? I don't know if you would like to answer that one, if you see that one, or Gordon. Um, give James a go first. Go on, James. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so certainly from a, an oat export perspective, we traditionally have, have been looking at the EU market. So um, from a trade deal view, obviously achieved that on the 24th of December. Um, that's obviously hugely positive because we're facing some pretty significant tariffs there. Um, there's still, you know, we're not at, at completely free trade levels now. 
as uh, we've left the customs union, we've got additional trade friction costs, which are going to be, you know, AHDB done some work estimating somewhere between two and five percent. Um, but that's certainly better than than a, a tariff that was upwards of, of 80, 80 uh, euros a ton. So um, in terms of third country opportunities, I think oats are something that probably have a, a particular market in North Africa. Um, the very health conscious consumer over there. And it's somewhere that certainly we're not necessarily exported into in a great deal historically, but um, opportunities there do exist. It's just about volume and, and quality. Brilliant. Um, and a question for you, Gordon. Um, we've got some questions about why the millers don't really like spring oats um, as opposed to winter oats. Would you like to answer that one, Gordon? Because um, I think it's an interesting one as, as the industry is moving forward and, and as part of the discussions we've had this morning. I think there's two points here. One, traditionally winter oats have been a, a more a stable um, uh, on farm. The quality has been better uh, over uh, an average period of, of many years. Uh, so, um, and um, but the, the advent of the variety Mascani has um, brought the, uh, milling quality to the fore. And it mills very, very easily in this business of hullability. So the um, desired optimum of, or benchmark of 25% uh, hulling losses on a commercial mill with Mascani is rarely achieved from the spring um, varieties or even spring grown Mascani. Um, so, uh, uh, but this year has shown up some um, improved quality in this respect from the spring crop. And um, be nice to know why that is. Um, so obviously it's something to do with the environment, but um, at this stage, no one's said, well, it's this, that, and the other. Um, so it's possible to get good hullability and milling quality from spring oats. And indeed, let's face it, <laughs> the Germans have been doing it for uh, years. Um, in Scotland, they grow spring oats. Um, winter oats is something that um, I suppose Aberystwyth and the English breeders have um, uh, developed and um, have been very good for hitherto for our business. It's only the advent of black grass and um, uh, uh, the reduced uh, um, number of um, herbicides we can use um, that have put this focus onto spring cropping. Lovely. Um, I think in the interest of time, I've got lots of questions for you all about TSP and um, virus control, fungicides, um, yeah, all sorts of things. Some questions for you, um, Stefan, about hectolitre weights and specifications in Germany, whether we've got maps like you kind of did. So I think um, what I will do is I'll collate all of the questions because um, everybody's asked some really interesting ones and some quite specific to you. We've got questions about Scotland versus East Anglia. We've got all sorts of different things. So what I'll do is collate those. Um, and if our speakers would be so happy as to put their thoughts on paper, um, we can then circulate those round to make sure everybody's received the answers to your questions. If you have got other questions that you haven't answered or you haven't asked if you pop them in the question box now and um, we can add them on likewise if you haven't quite done your basis in Neroso if you wanted to add um, your membership number and postcode into the box we can make sure that's registered um, so I think if we um, just go to our last um, couple of things we just like to run a quick poll having heard what you've heard um, from today what are you going to kind of focus a bit more on um, in 2021 um, harvest is it yield your quality your agronomy um, the marketing side and achieving that specification and, and hopefully there's a lot that you've heard from Rosemary for me and um, from Stefan um, and Sarah James this morning uh, that hopefully will add to that. Uh, so Christian if you'd like to display the results of that. Um, so we've got a good mixture of you. So look, agronomy has kind of increased and um, few of you thinking about yield, your quality, um, spec and marketing. So across the board, I hope very much it's been a useful um, session for you this morning. Um, and 
um, we will make sure there's a couple of people asking about the slides and the recording. I'll make sure the slides are available for you um, as well, because there's a lot of content um, there from our speakers today that will be worth looking back on. So I'm going to hand over to you, Gordon, um, to summarise this morning and the, the learnings and the findings we've had. Well, thank you very much, Teresa. Um, it's been a wonderful um, uh, session, um, great forum, uh, a, a huge number of subjects covered, and a, uh, I've got a long list of questions which um, will go on forever. But um, I think the point is this is a crop with potential, um, from the uh, and uh, um, we can have tremendous success from it. We can expect to find ways of um, making that success more sustainable um, by the work we are doing with this sort of um, discussion. Um, I'm slightly interested by the poll that we have a number of people um, quite early on who um, were frustrated by the um, not getting the market spec um, or the prices they were getting. Hopefully some of that quality issues um, uh, have been um, uh, uh, pointed out. Um, of course, the other way is that um, as producers, we don't um, market the crop very well. Um, we tend to um, be price takers and um, there must be scope in terms of pool marketing, group marketing, or even organizations like CamGrain where they collect grain, grade it, market it and deliver it to the end user just in time with a known quality and quantity um, would be able to deliver better value to producers um, without making it too much expensive um, for the end user. So there's probably something to be done there. But um, despite the frustrations, I think the crop has enormous potential and there's um, a lot of uh, information to be uh, um, sorted out from today's work. Thank you very much to all our speakers. I think um, it's been um, uh, really helpful. Thank you, Gordon. Um, so just to round up in terms of our resources and building on what Gordon said there, um, there's a few resources that are available for you. If you haven't downloaded it already, if you're one of those um, at the beginning that said you were new to the crop, there is a brilliant oat growth guide that Sarah um, and colleagues have been instrumental in putting together. I have put it on, um, Krishna and I put it on your handout. So on, on your GoToWebinar panel, there's a little one that says handouts. You can click on that and download the oat growth guide. You can order it as a hard copy. Um, let Sarah and I know um, if you'd like one of those. There is also the recommended list. Um, again, on the handouts, I've included the spring oat um, recommended list that AHDB puts together. There's a couple of you in the questions asking about recommendations for varieties. That might be a good place to start um, and looking at your Miller specification um, for that. Um, there is the um, oats project um, looking at nitrogen and Sarah, that's just come to fruition, hasn't it? Um, looking at some of the recommendations of that. Yeah, we're looking at uh, nitrogen and sulphur in winter and spring oats, looking at nitrogen rates and timing, uh, because there are quite big knowledge gaps and uh, need to update RB209. So we've done two years of trials. We've got this uh, last year is this season. So after that, we should have some more results to be able to share with you. Brilliant. Um, and we'll make sure they're published and probably may well bring you back, Sarah, to share the findings of that um, this time next year, which should be great. It's moved the industry forward a long way on that one. Um, the PhD, Sarah has mentioned already, um, it's an HDB funded PhD looking at fusarium resistance. And um, you can go onto the HDB website and look at that for the project reports for more details. And excitingly, um, as a way forward, as Gordon said, it's you know, the forum today and, and looking at Spring Oats, it's all about sharing information. Um, at Yen are launching an Oat Yen for 2021. And the hope is that that will get a number of growers, um, many of you may be out there today that will take part in that. And then we can look at that and learn much more about the crop. So again, the information on Oat Yen is on the website um, or feel free to contact Sarah, um, anybody at ADAS or myself for more information on that. 
So I think um, for me, it's, it's a big thank you. Um, thank you very much for all of you who've joined us. Um, we're absolutely delighted that there's so much interest in Spring Oaks across the country and that you've been able to join us today. Um, there will be a survey that pops up. If there's any kind of questions or comments um, that you've missed or you'd like to see this next year, um, please do add that on or feel free to drop me an email. Um, the session has been recorded and we'll make sure that's available on our HDB Series and YouTube channel and like I say I'll make sure the slides are available as well. And just a final, um, you know, thank you uh, for Gordon and myself for joining but most importantly a huge thank you um, to our speakers, to Rosemary and um, for your insights into your drilling dates um, and sharing the information on your cover crops, really interesting work for us as a community going forward. I've got lots of questions for you about rotations and, and how many years between oats, thank you for that. Ian, for your insights from a grower's point of view, the importance of getting those contracts and getting the marketing right, your agronomy and your insights into where oats fit into your rotation. To Stefan for sharing um, what's happening in Germany, for your oat breeding, your insights into how we best make the most of that, how we achieve the specification from the varieties you're putting together and lots of insight. And to James and Sarah um, for joining us uh, as you and, and many others in the industry that are working on this and it's great to have your insight. So on behalf of Gordon and I, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, if you have got questions, please feel free to drop me an email or give me a ring, the details are on there. And we look forward to seeing you again. Best of luck to those um, growing spring oats this season. Let's hope you get a bit more rain than last year. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day.